Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart, Lord, let it prove to be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are my strength, and Lord, you are indeed my redeemer. And this we ask in the name of Jesus, the Christ we pray. May we all say together, amen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, we're kicking off a brand new series. This is July the 1st. It's a brand new series that we are kicking off, and we're getting ready to talk about uh, the things that make Christians miserable. And these are often things that we need to look at in terms of what the Bible says versus what our culture is saying and what other people are saying and other voices that we actually we're listening to. And so we're going to be dealing with issues all throughout this entire month and, and dealing with the issues that so we can understand the biblical truth uh, that God gives us on today. Amen. Amen. And so today we're going to be talking about the truth about God, the truth about God. God, the biblical truth about God, because whether you believe it or not, a lot of people, man, don't follow God because they have issues with God. And it's so important, man, is that uh, we need to understand God because uh, without understanding what we believe, that determines whether we are bitter or blessed. What we believe determines our attitude, whether we are bitter or whether we're going to be blessed. And it's very important that we learn the right things about God because, number one, uh, cr creative design, we are made in the image of God. So we're made in the image and the likeness of him. So how we see him is going to be how we see ourselves. And when people got a distorted view of God, they're going to have a distorted view of themselves because by creation, they were made to, what, to reflect his image and to reflect his likeness. And so these are the issues we have. The most difficult thing about God that makes God so unique other than any other religion or any other God you come up with is that God is a God that you cannot explain. We just can't explain him. We can explain him. That's why people make their own gods. They make their own gods so they can understand it. And so the, the Greeks, what they did, they made their own gods. They had a God for sex. They had a God for this. had a God for that. Because they just have one God you know, it would be difficult to explain. Moses had the same issue with God because uh, e Egypt, they had over 30,000 gods. They had gods for different things and different things. And when you get to Exodus 3, and when Moses said, I'm going to Pharaoh, and I'm telling Pharaoh, I'm coming in the name of God. But how do I explain you? How do I explain you? I mean, I mean, how do, I mean who, who do I tell him you are? And then God says, you cannot explain me, but I'll tell you what, just tell him I am that I am. You know, you, you, you can't explain him. You know, he just can't explain him. And one of the reasons why you can't explain him, because he's infinite and we're finite. We, he's unlimited and we're limited. So to try to understand uh, something that's unlimited with a limited mind, your brain will blow up. There's no way in the world you can contain anything about God. And that's why the Bible, God only gave us one book. He gave us one book because, and the reason why he gave us one book, because we could not take them more than that. And so what we have, most of us in here, we learn about God based on what he reveals about himself. So it's really called, it's called progressive revelation. And that's why the Bible doesn't need but one book. Why? Because it'll take the rest of my life to try to understand what a limited mind what an unlimited mind wrote and could fully and be able to fully understand it. You can't do it. You can't do it. So I could preach the same text for the next 50 years and preach it differently. As I get more revelation, then I could be able to teach more. So that's the, just the way, 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 way God works. And so we got a God that we cannot explain. We got a God that we got to depend on him to reveal to us the things he wants us to know about him. And that's why he wrote a book. He wrote a book because, hey, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. He said, guess what? As high as the heaven is above the earth, that's as high as I am above you. And you're not going to be able to understand everything about me. And so what happened is we got issues with following God because we cannot explain him. And anything that you cannot explain can easily be distorted. So let's go and look at what is happening here. So Satan comes on the scene, and in the beginning of Genesis, what happened is that man needed to know God. Satan steps in and distorts God so that man won't understand God. 
I know, and, and Jesus talked about that. He told them their religion. He said, man, y'all been listening too much to, to lies. So what are y'all saying about God? It's not really, it's not really true. And, and so here we are, they had a religion set up, and Jesus had to come back and said, you heard it said this, but this is what I say. You heard you've been taught this, but this is what I'm teaching you. Satan has lied to you and given you a distorted view of God. And then Jesus said in John 8, 44, he's saying that what, what is Satan? Satan is the father of lies. He's the father of lies. And guess what? And Satan can appeal to yourself that you'll wind up doing what Satan wants you to do. That's what he meant by the lust of your father you will do. So how does Satan present himself to us? He presents himself to us as us. So you know what? Anything that you do that's not of God, Satan is telling you to do that. Anything that you base on what you think and what you believe, Satan is telling you that. Amen? Satan is telling you that. Because God is saying, I left a book and I want you to live by every word that come out of the mouth of God so that you don't have to trust what you feel and you don't have to trust what you believe and you ain't got to trust what you think. So let me give you four lies that Satan has put out about God that's got men confused in our culture today. And why a lot of people don't follow God. Even people who claim they love him don't follow him. Even people who join the church, they don't follow him. They come to church, but they really don't follow him. Because Satan, Satan, Satan has a strategy, and that strategy started in Genesis. Now listen, I want you to go to Genesis 2.17. 217. Now here it is. Here it is. God put Adam and Eve. The Bible says God planted a garden, put Adam and Eve in the garden. They were actually living in paradise. You know, everything they wanted, everything they needed, God provided that for them. He planted the garden. He put them in, in the garden of Eden. Now historians are saying that the garden was so vast and so big, there were probably thousands of trees in the garden. You know, and, the, and so Satan's argument to them is the argument that he makes to most of us. So I want you to write this first lie he's going to tell. He's going to convince them that God is unreasonable. That God is unreasonable. Okay? And this is how he did it. Now here they are in the garden. They're in the garden eating Genesis 2, 17. You know, they got everything they want, everything that they need. You know, they can just walk around, it's a, it, whatever, there was unlimited. But in verse 17, God says, now, every tree in the garden you may freely eat. But the tree of the knowledge of good and eat, evil, thou shall not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, therefore thou shalt surely die. So I got thousands of trees in the garden I can eat from. <laughs> I'm living in paradise I ain't working nowhere and all the stuff that God has given to me and now they end, and God said no, one tree that I don't want you to eat from and that's the tree of the knowledge what of good and evil for the day you eat it you're going to what you're going to die and what do you mean by die death death was separation from God in other words, God says, you know what, you, you, all your security is going to be good as long as I'm with you. But if not, if you ain't going to do right, I'm going to kick you out and you're going to be separated from me. And all the security and everything I gave you, you're going to lose all of that. Now watch it. Go to Genesis 3 and 1. Genesis 3 and 1. You got all that going, man. Got all that going. Amen. And look at Genesis 3 and 1. It said, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God says. Now listen, he's asking a question. He said, Wait a minute now. Wait a minute. Did God tell you that you can't eat of every tree of the garden? He's asking a question. Every time the enemy wants to, this, to, to create doubt in us, it starts off with a question. Amen. Amen? And so what it is, he's trying to switch truth for a lie. Amen? Instead of taking God in his word, the enemy said, wait a minute, hold a minute, hold a minute, hold a minute. 
Did God tell you that? That of every tree you in the garden that you cannot freely eat? And then the woman answers him and says, yes, he told us that, you know what, we can eat of every tree but the tree of the, in the midst of the garden. We cannot eat it or even touch it or we're going to die. And then Satan comes back and says, no, you shall not surely die. Think about it. Most people who come and they get teaching from God, the enemy always gets you when you start questioning God. When you start questioning, should I really do this? I, I remember, I remember um, some years ago, we were doing vacation Bible school here at the church, and, and some of my, uh, uh, that's when MC Hammer was very popular during that time. And uh, he was in a, at the Bell Auditorium on the night of our jamboree. And some of my young people came to me, and here's the thing that most people ask you. Well, Pastor, Pastor, you know, can we be excused from the jamboree? We want to go see MC Hammer. Because, see, ain't nothing wrong. I don't see nothing wrong with going to see MC Hammer. And other words, Satan said, Satan is not questioning them. I really don't see nothing wrong with being able to see uh, MC Hammer. Why can't we go see MC Hammer? And so I looked at them, and I said, let me ask you a question. What if I could make arrangements for MC Hammer to come to the church? You know, I, I make a phone call, let him come to the church, and whatever he going, y'all go pay for at the Bell Auditorium. What if he could do it right here at the church? They said, oh no, Pastor, that wouldn't be appropriate. What do you mean that wouldn't be appropriate? You know, you know, he don't need to come to the church. So let me ask you a question. You're supposed to be the church, right? Right? So you don't want MC Hammer to come to the place where the church gathers, but you're willing to take the church to him. And pay for it. And so they began to ask me a question. Where, how do we make the decisions then, Pastor, when, when God's word is not pretty clear on what we need to do? I say there are four things you need to ask yourself. Four questions you need to ask yourself. When you're not sure about what you should do, amen, four questions you need to ask yourself. Any, listen, any place that you go that you cannot invite the Lord to go with you, then you ain't got no minutes going there. I mean, if God's not going to be comfortable there, then why are you going? Why are you going? Amen? Anything you do that you can't ask the Lord to help me to do this for your glory, then you ain't got no business doing that. Anything you put in your mouth that you can't say the blessing over and say, Lord, bless this for the nourishment of my body then it has no business going in your mouth. Anything that come out of your mouth that you can't say amen behind it, then maybe you don't need to have that kind of those kind of words coming out of your mouth. And so the enemy has a way of coming up with stuff that what? Because here's the enemy's strategy. The one thing he wants you to do, he wants to create doubt in your mind. He starts off, if I can get you to what? I can get you to have doubt that I can deceive you. Doubt will always lead to deception. Deception will lead to destruction. That's how he gets us every time. He's tried to switch the truth of God and make the truth of God a lie that caused the doubt about God. That's why a lot of people don't follow him. Then they follow for the deception that he's going to come up with. He came up and told her, hey, man, you got to worry about that. God don't want you to eat this fruit because when you eat this fruit, you'll be as wise as he is. And now you know what? You're going to be elevated if you do this. And what happened? It wind up in destruction. They wind up getting kicked out of the garden. And guess what? Sin now is our biggest issue in our, in our world. So there's the first line. God is just unreasonable. That's not even true. Let me give you two things about God I want you to write down. God is compassionate. He is compassionate. He is compassionate. And what is compassion? Compassion, there's a difference between, there are three levels of care you can give an individual when an individual is in trouble. There are three levels of care you can give them. Now, the first level of care, you can what? Have sympathy for them. And what you mean by having sympathy for them, you're saying, I hurt for you. And then if you, you can move to another level, you can have empathy for them. And E-M-P-A-T-H-Y. And what happens when I'm empathetic? I'm empathetic when I said, I'm hurt as you hurt. You know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm hurt as you hurt. So sympathy says, I hurt for you. 
empathy said, I'm feeling your pain. I'm hurting because you're hurting. But then the third level is called compassion. Compassion is when you do something to help the person that's hurting. And sympathy, you ain't going to do nothing. You're just going to say, I'm sorry for you. And empathy, you're going to cry with them. Say, I'm crying right here with you. But compassion is the highest expression of love that moves you to want to do something for them. And that's what God is. God is compassionate toward us. He's compassionate toward us. You think about it. Anything that we got, everything we got is because of God. Amen. It's because of God. Amen. We don't deserve anything. We haven't earned anything. But God was moved, moved by his love for us. And that's why you're alive this morning. That's why you're moving. That's why you have your being. Somebody ought to say, thank God for his compassion. Amen. Amen. Go to Psalm 145. Go to Psalm 145. He said, the Lord is gracious. In verse number 8, he said, the Lord is gracious. And the Lord is full of compassion. What is grace? Grace is giving you what you don't deserve. Because that's what love does. Love don't ever give people what they deserve. Love gives people what they need. Love always extends grace. And some people say, hey, man, you deserve to be cussed out, but that ain't what you need. <laughs> so I'm going to extend you some grace. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. And that's what, that's what love does. Love always extends grace. Love is full of compassion. Love wants to do something. When you see somebody hurting, their hurt is not an obligation for you. It's an opportunity to demonstrate your love. That's compassion. God is that way. He's slow to anger. Oh my God. And the reason why God is slow to anger, because he keeps forgiving you over and over again. People who are really angry have unresolved issues in their heart toward another individual. But if you forgive folk, then anger has nothing to be pulled from. Anger is not a primary emotion. It's a secondary one. And so what happened is people open up the anger that's already in us. But when you forgive folk, then there's nothing for anger to pull from. And so God is slow to anger. God is a great mercy. Oh, my God. Amen. What a scripture. Verse 9. Verse 9. Verse 9. Amen. He said, the Lord is good to us all. And his tender mercies are over all his works. God is a compassionate God. He's a compassionate God. Lamentations 3.22. Lamentations 3.22. Okay. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Why? Because his compassions, what? Fail not. Amen. God keeps looking out for me. God keeps pulling me out of messes. God keeps helping me when I can't help myself. God, his compassions never fail. So the enemy has told another lie when he said God is unreasonable. He's told a lie. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Even the essence of what the enemy said doesn't make any sense. How can God be unreasonable if he gave you a thousands of trees that you could eat from and only tell you you can't eat from but one? Oh, God, that's pretty unreasonable, ain't it? How can God be unreasonable, AJ, when he gives you his money, he said the silver is mine, the gold is mine, and lets you keep 90% and say, just give me 10. I mean, how is that unreasonable? And when men could not even, what, didn't know how to serve God because the Jews, man, had it so awful that people didn't know how to, people couldn't, they couldn't, they, they, they couldn't serve him because they had over 600 and some laws that everybody had to pass. You know, there were 365 laws that you could do that were positive. That's for one law for every bone in your body. And then they had, a, what, um, 
I mean, 365 uh, negative things that for one bone for every uh, day of the year, there were 365 negative things that you could not do. And then there had 240 positive things that you could do. That's for one law for every bone that was in your body. And so that was 600 and some laws that they, people had to keep up with. And Jesus said, that is completely unreasonable. He broke it down into two. He said, all you got to do is just do these two commandments. They love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind then love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments that's going to take care of the whole bible the laws and the prophet was the whole old testament then and, and you're going to call god unreasonable oh my god amen six days thou shall labor you can work for yourself just give me one one day out of six and you're going to listen to the devil's lie that God is unreasonable. Doesn't make any sense. He's unreasonable, number one, because he's compassionate. He's reasonable. He's compassionate. Here's number two. He's reasonable because he's committed to my happiness. You know, God wants us to be happy. He really do. What did Jesus leave to us? He left joy and peace. He put that in the will. He said, my peace I'm going to give to you. Not as the world going to give it to you. And then he says, well, I'm going to make sure that my joy remains full in you. So how in the world are you going to not be happy if you got joy and peace? Amen? Write these scriptures down. This is going to help you. Psalm 37 and 4. And Psalm 37 and 4. It said, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee what? The desires of your heart. Really? <laughs> Boy, that's unreasonable, ain't it? I mean, if your delight would be in the Lord, God says, guess what? I give you the desires that are in your heart. I will give them to you myself. Amen? Amen? 1 Timothy 6, 17. The first thing it says, charge them that are rich and that are high-minded. They be not high-minded. Not trust in the uncertain riches, but in the living God. Why? He gives us richly all things for us to enjoy. What a God. Romans 8, 32. In Romans 8, and verse number 32, he said, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The greatest need that you and I needed was a Savior, and God was willing to give up his own son to make sure you and I could be saved. So if he was willing to give up his son, what else can you think of that God wouldn't give up for you? <laughs> Amen. In Psalm 84 and verse number 11. For the Lord God is a son and a shield, and the Lord will give grace and glory. Listen, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So God has committed to our habits. So the first lie of the devil... That's not true. Call him a liar. It's just not true. He says that God is unreasonable. Here's the second lie of the devil. The second lie of the devil. He said not only God is unreasonable, he said God is unreliable. Hmm. Go to Genesis 3 again. Go to 3 through 5. <clears throat> Here's somebody to tell Eve. But the truth of the tree which is in the midst of the garden... God has said, you shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. She answers the question. Listen to what the serpent says. <laughs> you can't rely on that. God done lied to you. You shall not surely die. And here's the thing about many of us, man. We believe the devil's lie. God says, if you eat this, you're going to die. Satan said, go ahead and eat it, you ain't going to die. God said, if you do this, this is going to hurt you. Satan said, no, you can go ahead and do it. It ain't going to hurt you. <laughs> I've learned this the hard way. Whenever God tells you you can do something, he says, help yourself. Whenever God tells you not to do something, he says, don't hurt yourself. And all of that is out of love for you. Because let me tell you something. Anything that's good can become bad if you misuse it. <laughs> I mean, food is good. But if you misuse food, 
Your food can kill you. And a whole lot of people right now, they're dying because of stuff they're eating. Amen? I mean, water is good. But if you get too much of it, you'll drown. Water can kill you. Fire is good. But if you get it in the wrong places, fire will destroy you. Sex is good. I mean, God gave us our sexual desires, amen? He gave these things to us. But if you misuse it, sex can kill you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Amen? You think about it, man. If we did sex the way God told us to deal sex, then we would not have STDs. We didn't really have venereal diseases. We would not have AIDS. We did not have syphilis. We did not have gonorrhea. We did not have all these diseases you're talking about. Why are you having all these diseases? It's because what? Hey, you're misusing it. <laughs> and when you misuse it, it's going to create a problem. So God is not reliable, man. What are you talking about? Verse 4. Listen to what the enemy says. Watch this now. For God knows this. You can't rely on what God telling you. He knows that the day you eat this, your eyes shall be open. And you shall be as gods. And you would know good and evil. Oh my God. So you're telling me that the instructions that God gave to them was not a reliable discretion. He said, don't rely on that. Don't rely on that. <laughs> but how many of you know that's a lie? That's not true. Now, there are four ways that we know that God can be relied on. Four ways God can be relied on. Number one, we know his word is concrete. It's concrete. Isaiah 40 and 8. And what does it say? The grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of our God will stand how long? Forever. Now, tell me you can't rely on that. Because ain't nothing in your life is forever. Only God's word is forever. And so God says his word is concrete. God says not only his word is concrete, his love for us is consistent. Romans 11, 29. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. In other words, God is not going to change his mind when it comes to loving us. Amen? His love is consistent. When we right, he loves us. When we wrong, we loves us. When we good, he loves us. When we're bad, we loves us. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Now, God can get angry, but he can never be disappointed. God is never disappointed. He get angry, but he never get disappointed. What, you and I get disappointed because stuff happens we don't expect. That's why we get disappointed. We get disappointed because of something we don't know. But think about it. Here's a God that knows everything. So God is not disappointed. He knows every sin you're going to commit. He knows everything that you're going to do. He knows every time you're going to mess up. You know, God is not up in heaven saying, oh my God, you did that. <laughs> he is never disappointed. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He just takes what we do and works it all together and puts it in his plan and in his purpose. That's why everything in our life that's not by design, God sets it up so it can develop us to get us to our design. That's why some people get divorced. They get divorced because they married somebody that was not in God's design, and God used that individual to develop them to get them prepared for what he designed for them. Because here's the thing, only God can take a bad thing and work it out and make a bad thing turn out to be a good thing. Only God can take a stumbling block and take a stumbling block and use it as a stepping stone. Only God can take the misery in your life and turn your misery into a ministry that will be a blessing to other people. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? So God is not disappointed. Oh, he's reliable, I tell you. I said some, somebody other than me ought to say he's reliable. He's reliable, man. His love for us, man, is consistent. Number three, you can count on God. You can count on him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and it says, trust in the Lord. The word trust means to rely. You can rely upon the Lord. You can rely upon the Lord. Amen? And why can God, just, God can do something that men can't do? And here's the thing that we cannot do. I can't order you to trust me. I have to earn your trust. 
And the reason why you have to, have to earn your trust, because see, trust is based on being secure about your love. And that's why you can't already trust people, because sometimes they can do things that make you insecure about their love for you. When a woman tells a man, I don't trust you, it ain't about the, the women he may be running around with. The problem is, I'm insecure about how you love me. Because if you love me right, you wouldn't be doing that. So that's why I don't trust you. See? But we got a God that's so consistent in his love that he can command us to trust him. Oh my God, amen. Because I told you, I promise you, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Well, that's, a, that's the thing, man. It's, 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 you can count on. So you rely on God. And how do you rely on God? You resist yourself. Lean not to your own understanding. And then guess what you do? If you rely on God and you can resist yourself, then guess what you can do? You can receive what God has for you. And that is, he will direct your path. And what do I mean by directing your path? It means he will cut a path. Because the path that God has for us, we can't do it ourselves. He has to do it because it's a supernatural path. It's not a natural one. So you learn to rely on God. You learn to resist yourself. Then you can receive what God has for you. Here's number four. He cares for us. You can rely on God because he cares for you. First Peter 5, 7, it said to cast all of your care upon him for what he care for you. And the word care in the Bible means to pay attention to. So God is saying, you don't have to give attention to things in your life that you can't handle. Give those things to me and I will give it my attention. <laughs> That's the antidote for worry. If something's going wrong in my life, God said, why do you continue to give attention to stuff that you cannot handle? Why don't you just give that to me and let me, get, let me put my attention to it? Because there's some things in your life you ain't going to be able to do. There's some things in your life you need to watch me do. And so, therefore, when you get to the red seas of your life, don't be trying to figure out how you're going to drink all that water because you ain't going to be able to do all that. All you got to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So I've learned not to worry about anything. I learned what I can do and the things I cannot do. I learned to give it to God because he would put his attention to it. And that's what God is telling us to do. The second lie of the devil is that he says that God is unreliable. Okay. What is the truth? The truth is his word is concrete. His love is consistent. Amen? We can count on God. And then fourthly, he cares for us. Here's number three. The third lie of the devil is the devil accuses God of being unconcerned. He's unconcerned about me. He's unconcerned. And we either go through issues like, this is just too petty, this is too insignificant, and God is not going to do anything. Or you go through this thing, I'm not worthy. And I have people talking about it all the time. People don't take communion. I'm not worthy to take communion. Really? You're not worthy because you know what? I'm in some kind of sin in my life. That makes me not worthy. Well, if that was the case, ain't nobody worthy. Because the last time I read the book, the Bible said all have sinned. And everybody has come short of the glory of God. So therefore, if sin is an issue that makes me unworthy, then none of us are worthy. That's why you and I are going to heaven on Jesus Christ. He said, called the doctrine of substitution. He took my sin. He gave me his righteousness. And my sin has already been judged. It was judged on Calvary. And what happened is Jesus paid for it. Amen? So that ain't nothing but your ego and your pride telling you that. And the enemy would come out and put that guilt trip on you. And make you feel guilty for being you. And what do you mean by being you? For realizing that you ain't what you think you are. That's why God sent us trials. He sends us tests. Why did a teacher give the student a test? So the student would know just what they know. Because it's easy to say, I got this. 
It's easy to say, I got it all together until you get tested. So to say that God is unconcerned about me. Go to Matthew 10. Let's, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get rid of this lie. It's are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall fall on the ground uh, without. Amen. Go to verse number 30. But the very halves of your head are all numbered. Verse number 31. Verse number 31. Fear ye not, therefore. Aren't you more valuable than many sparrows? You mean to tell me that God is saying that if I care this much for birds, you mean to tell me I won't care for you? If everything is so important to me that the very hairs on your head are numbered. Amen. That's how detailed I am. And you're going to say, I don't care for you? Wow. That devil is nothing but a liar. Look what Jesus said in John 14, 23. And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. In other words, we'll stay with him. We'll stay with him. The devil's a liar. Matthew 6, 33. What does he say? Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all of its righteousness. And guess what I do? I add everything you need unto you. That's what God will do. Amen? So what's the lie of the devil? As I get ready to close this thing, man. Because the lie of the devil, he will use doubt, and doubt would lead you to deception, and deception would always lead you to destruction. And that's why most people don't follow God, because they'd rather believe the devil's lies than to read the Bible and live by God's truth. The enemy will accuse God of being unreasonable. We don't find out today that that's a lie. The enemy accused God of being unreliable. We don't find out today that that's a lie. The enemy accuses God of being unconcerned. And we don't find out today that that's a lie. Let me look at the fourth lie and I close on today. It says God is unpleasable. You can't please him. You can't please him. People, people say so like AJ, I'm pressing on and I'm just trying to make it in. Really? <laughs> really? And that's why, that's why the Jehovah false witnesses, this is why it doesn't make any sense. Because how can you be a witness of Jehovah unless you are completely like Jehovah? And that means you got to be completely without sin. <laughs> and you know, and listen, Ephesians 1.4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Are you serious? Because of Jesus Christ. God says, when I look at you, I look at you as being someone that's holy and without blame. Let me tell you something, man. Heaven is a perfect place. And it's only for perfect people. And if you and I go up there with sin, it will no longer be a perfect place. So Jesus Christ took my sin away. And I'm going to heaven on the righteousness of Christ. And to make it even better, he's going to get rid of this body that's contaminated with sin and give me another body and sin will no longer be an issue in my life so what do you mean you cannot please God he sent his son so you can please him he sent the Holy Ghost so you can please him the devil is nothing but a liar amen Romans 3 22 Romans 3 22 so even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, what is the righteousness of God? We get it by faith in Jesus Christ. Upon all and upon all them for that believe, for there is no difference. Why do we need Jesus? Because all have sinned and come short 
of the glory of God. And I'm glad to know that I serve a God today that is not holding me to a legalistic obedience. A legalistic obedience is that God is not expecting you to do everything right. It's hard to do right when you're in sin. It's hard to do right with a sinful body. It's hard to do right when an old nature is still in you. So that's, the, that's the, 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 the joy of our life, the struggle of our life, is that God knows you're not going to do it perfect with these bodies. But what's going to happen, he wants you to make progress. Am I perfect? No. Because every time I think I'm going in the right direction, God shines the light on me and I see some more sin. The closer you live to God, the more you see wrong with you. And the only people who walk around acting so self-righteous and acting like they're more holier than thou is because they're not living in the light. And so in the dark, they don't see nothing else. But thank God, when you walk in the light, God will expose things that you cannot see in the dark. How many times, man, you ever thought you had on blue socks? And you uh, black socks, and you went outside and realized when the light hit it, it was what it wasn't black, it was blue. How many times you thought something was clean until you went outside and the light hit it and you saw it wasn't clean, it was still dirty. So when you walk with God, He shines the light on you. The more holy people are always humble people because God keeps showing them what's wrong with them. I like what Paul said as I closed on the day in Philippians 3.12. And Paul is the greatest Christian that's in the New Testament. And this is what Paul said. He says, not as though I'd already attained. And neither I am already perfect. Wait a minute, Paul. I mean, you wrote the majority of the New Testament. You wrote the majority of the New Testament. But Paul said, now I want y'all to think I'm already perfect. But let me tell you what I follow after. That I may apprehend or lay hold of that which is also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. 13, go ahead, Paul, help us out. Brethren, I count not myself to have arrived, to have apprehended. But let me tell you the one thing I do. I learn to forget the things which are behind me. That means forget the bad things that I've done, but also forget the good things that I've done because I still got someplace else I need to go. I'm not going to let the bad thing keep me from the day, but I'm not going to let the good thing make me keep me from the day because what I'm going to do, I'm going to put all that behind me because I got a tomorrow I'm working on and I can't work on tomorrow unless I live in today. So I forget the things that are behind me. And guess what I'm doing? I'm reaching forth to the things which are before me. And then Paul said, I press. Oh my God. I'm pressing toward that mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ because every round just go higher and higher and higher and higher and so this is what you do what do you mean that God is unprincipled this is the joy of my life I do not believe in the devil's lies he's a bald faced lie when he said that God is unreasonable that he said God is unreliable he says God is not un is unconcerned and he got the nerve to say that God is unpleasable. I can do all things through Christ which gives me his strength. Give God praise and glory. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Wow, man. This Sunday, this Sunday at, at 7.30, a.m. And this is just for this Sunday only. This is our parking lot communion uh, because it's going to be outside. We have it at 7.30 so that we can get, escape the heat because it is hot. It is hot. So 7.30 uh, Sunday morning. Hey, drive up. Uh, guess what? You can tune into your radio station uh, while you're in the car. You can hear us very plainly on 104.7. Um, we're going to do our parking lot communion service amen and I'm gonna talk about the foundation for real happiness I'm gonna give you some things that's gonna make you real happy and we're gonna have a happy time uh, in this place on Sunday amen horns blowing all kinds of stuff to say man we gonna leave here smiling because that's what God does in our life so we want you to keep that in mind Sunday morning 7 30 a.m. 
for the parking lot community. In a time like this, you're going to need a savior. And you're going to need an anchor. And you need to be sure and very sure that the anchor holds and grips the solid rock. We believe that rock is Jesus Christ himself. In John 14 and 6, he says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. That means I am the one and only way. I'm on the one and only truth. And I can give you the one and only life. And for whatever reason, when you're the sound of my voice, that you're not sure about your relationship with Jesus Christ, or if you die at this moment, you're not sure you're going to spend eternity in heaven, we don't want you to go to go that way. 706-724-1720, uh, give us a call. And I'll tell you what, we'll have someone call you and counsel you and minister to you. If you got a prayer need in your life, I just call the number and say, hey, will you call us, have somebody call me and pray for me? And somebody would make sure we have somebody call you and do that as well. If you don't have a church home, you still can connect to Greater Young Zion. Just call 706-724-1720, leave a message, and our staff will get back with you and show you how that is done as well. I want you to keep this in mind also uh, that that you can support this ministry and this is important in a critical time that even though we're out of fellowship uh, as we want to be, we're still the church and so we still depend on your offerings and your sub financial support to continue to support this ministry and move it forward. Uh, so we ask you if you are a disciple of Greater Young Zion, we expect you to give. If you're not a disciple, we welcome your giving uh, as well. And there's six ways you can give at GYZ. You can give at GYZ uh, by, by uh, 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 simply uh, mailing your offering in and uh, you can just put GYZ, uh, P.O. Box 1864, Augusta, Georgia. That's a way of doing it. Or if you don't, if you, you can also go to your bank and put us on your bill pay and then have them send the gift to GYZ. Or you can just come by the church, go to the drive through with the mailbox, and uh, we have offertory envelopes on the door if you want to use those. And then you can just drop it in the office drop box, and we do appreciate your giving uh, uh, in, the, in that way as well. You can go to our app. It's called Give Plus. We have a Give Plus app. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, call the number 706-724-1720. And you can, you what? You can give that way. You can go to our website. Website is greateryoungzion.org. Hit donations and give your donations that way. Or if you got Cash App, you can use our Cash App uh, 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 contact. And that is dollar sign capital G Y Z. AUG, you can do that as well. And we'd be more than happy uh, to receive your gift. And thank you so very much for what you do. In the critical times we're living in, we're still counting on prayer, asking you to continue to pray uh, for this pandemic that we're in. We pray for those who are struggling in this pandemic. We pray for those who uh, are suffering bereavement. Uh, because of this pandemic, hospitalized, those who are tested positive, whatever the situation may be, we lift you up in prayer. Also, pray for our leaders, both national, state, and local. Also, we're going to ask that you pray for our medical personnel, our doctors, nurses, medicine, all those things they are doing uh, to risk their lives in order to save our lives. We believe that God is the ultimate healer, and he's in control, and we can trust on that as well. Let's lift up the heaven and let's be as we, we get ready to pray and uh, ask God to just do all of these things that we've asked. We ask that you would continue to bless you, bless the word, let your word go forth. In the book of Thessalonians, you said, Lord, we need to pray that your word will have free course. We are praying for that on today, that it will touch as many lives as it possibly can be touched. Bring the hope in the midst of hopelessness and bring healing in the middle of hurt. God, we just continue to depend upon you on this day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let us all say together, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time.